Today we're actually finishing the sermon series that we have on the book of Daniel. Uh, I have a great honor of finishing this series. Uh, I'm going to be going through Daniel chapter 6. Daniel has more than six chapters, but we're going to stop at chapter 6. We're finishing our whole series. And you know, I truly loved and enjoyed this series. I love when, I, I don't know how to explain it, I never really took the time. I would read the Bible from beginning to end. I would read the Bible from beginning to end when I can, trying to do that every single year. But for me, it's always just a struggle to stop and just dive deep into one book of the Bible at a time. I mean, we were on this sermon series for a couple months, and me following along with the sermon series, I would sit down, and for my devotions, I would read from the book of Daniel. Every single time that I would do devotion, I would make sure to read a little bit from the book of Daniel and see what God is going to be saying. And man, they're so amazing that I read it so many times over, and every single time that I read it, God says something new. There is something that God reveals that is deeper and deeper. There are so many lessons that can be taken for our time, for our world right now, specifically from the book of Daniel. And I'm going to be going over that in my sermon today. And you know, the title of my sermon today is, God Wants to Set You Apart. God wants to set you apart. He wants you to be different. He wants you to look different. He wants you to speak different. God wants to set people apart. And you know, before we're going to dive into Daniel chapter 6, we have to go through some background in Daniel chapter 5. There's something interesting that happens at the end of Daniel chapter 5. If you guys could please open with me to Daniel chapter 5, the last few verses. And it's going to be from verse, we're going to be reading from verse 25. Daniel chapter 5, verse 25. Uh, we know that uh, we're, when Oleg was preaching, Oleg Tillotson on uh, Daniel chapter 5, everything that happened there with uh, King Belteshazzar and how uh, his kingdom came to an end because of the things that he did, because he didn't glorify God and he was just trying to glorify himself. But let's read from Daniel ch uh, chapter 5, from verse 25 to the end. Now, this is the inscription that was written out Mene, Mene, Tekel, Aparsin. This is the interpretation of the message Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So the important thing that happened here as we see, is that the Babylonian Empire here came to an end with the death of Belshazzar the king. And now the Medo-Persian Empire or the Medo-Persian era has come into being. So now the, the empire that is ruling everything, or you could say in the world or whatever, is the Medo-Persian Empire. There, Daniel's still in Babylon, but Babylon has been taken over. It's still the city of Babylon, but there is no longer a thing as the Babylonian Empire. It has been destroyed. It has been taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And with that, let's go straight into chapter 6 uh, of Daniel. I've divided the chapter in three different sections. Uh, the first section, and my main point of that is for my uh, theme or topic of being set apart, is how do we be, or uh, what does it look like to be set apart? The second section, or the second main point, is going to be what do we have to do to be set apart? How can we be set apart for God? And the last one is, why do we have to be set apart? Or what are the results of you being a set apart? What is that going to do in the world? Or what did that do for Daniel? And with that, let's read from Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. It's going to be the first section. And it says, It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, and they, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguish, distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began to trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with the regard to the law of his God. 
Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the, whole, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the good document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. So here in the first part or that I divided the book of uh, chapter 6 of Daniel, we see what is happening. We see, we're going to see, and I'm about to unpackage a uh, little kind of verse by verse of how was Daniel set apart. What set Daniel apart? What does it look like to be set apart from everybody else? And with that, I want to go into verse 3. And it says, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. And you know, this is a reference to Daniel chapter 5, verse 14, which it says where K King Belshazzar speaks to Daniel. And he says this, now I have heard about you that a spirit of the God is in you and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom has been found in you. Man, when I read that, it kind of blew my mind that this king who didn't know who God was, that this king who was of this world would say such an extraordinary thing to Daniel, that the spirit of God is in you. There is something different about Daniel that he can tell. And that's what he's saying here uh, in, ch in chapter 6, verse 3, that again, Daniel began to excel over even all the commissioners. This, we're not talking about just over common people anymore. We're talking about the highest of the highest officials. We're talking about the best of the best. We're talking about the people that are ruling this mighty Persian empire. And Daniel was excelling over every single one of them. He was separated. He was different. There was something different about him. The king saw that he had an extraordinary spirit within him, just like the previous king seen about him. And it, it, to the point where he's like, I'm going to appoint him over the entire kingdom. He's going to be second to none except for me. And when I read that, I'm like, man, I, I heard this story before somewhere. I've seen this in the scripture before with the story of Joseph, where Joseph comes to Egypt as a slave, as nothing, as nobody, and because of him having a relationship with God, because of him choosing to separate himself and not be like everybody else, to walk with God, he also from the dungeon into the second of command of the whole kingdom of Egypt. Again, we see this also in the book of Esther where Mordecai was also appointed second in command of the entire kingdom because he chose to stand in the gap, because he chose to separate himself and stand for his nation we see this in the book of, of Kings when David was chosen because of the heart that God seen with him because he was some, there was something different between him and his brothers. There was something different in him than there was in all the other people of that time of Israel. David was chosen. And with that, let's go to verse 4. It says, and this kind of explains it, then the commissioners and satraps began to trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could not find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption, and as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Daniel was different. I mean, they looked, these people knew him. They served with him. And there was no fault that was found in Daniel. I mean, they looked through everything, absolutely everything. And there is nothing, no error in his ways, no skeletons in his closets. There's nothing that they could find to condemn Daniel. And in, it's not talking about him being a Christian here. It said in government affairs, there was nothing to find that could blame Daniel for when he was at work. There was nothing that they could find in Daniel when he was just hanging out with other people. There was nothing that they could find blameless or any error in Daniel and anything and everything that he did. He was faithful to God. He stood faithful. He stood different. He didn't look like everybody else. He didn't indulge in the things of Babylon or in the things of this world, you could say. And you know, going to chapter 5 right away, it says, Then these men said, 
We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it, find it against him with regard to the law of, law of God. You know, these men, they knew Daniel, and they knew that they couldn't trap him or ensnare him with the things of this world or with evil deeds or with any corruption or errors, but they knew that at the same time, they knew that he was gonna be faithful to God. No matter what we say, and they're already come up, coming up with a panda like, look, even if we do this that we're gonna read after the, uh, uh, the verse we're gonna read after, they come up with a plan to say that, look, King, so this is what we're gonna do. We, we consulted with everybody and uh, all the people and they lied because they didn't talk to Daniel about this. I mean, he was the, one of the top three ch people in charge of the whole kingdom. But they said, we talked to all the officials and everybody saying, look, we're gonna make a decree that nobody for a month, for 30 days, is gonna worship or pray to or serve any other God but you, O king. They have to worship you, they have to pray to you. They can't bow before anything else. They created this plan to ensnare Daniel knowing that he's gonna be faithful, even though the thing that's gonna happen if Daniel does not obey this decree, he's gonna be thrown into a lion's den. So in that time, that meant death. They came up with a plan knowing that even facing death, no matter what Daniel is gonna face, he's gonna be faithful to his God. And I think that's so powerful. And I remember I was thinking when I was creating this sermon, man, I, I wonder if anybody could say that about us. That even in the midst of trials, in the midst of us standing before certain death, are we going to stand faithful to our God? Are we still gonna represent God? Are we still gonna be set apart? Are we still gonna walk the narrow path? And you know, I wanna read a, a quote that somebody said. It says, suppose the law was passed in America that no man is to pray during the month of October. And if you do, you shall be cast into the lion den of hungry lions. How many people would continue praying? I think that there would be a very small amount of people at the prayer meeting or Sunday service. And you know, this uh, author says, I'm afraid that the prayer meeting and prayer altogether shall be postponed for a whole month. But it wasn't like that for Daniel. And we're about to read what Daniel did. And I just want to re reiterate something. You know, Daniel was set apart in all that he did. The reason being is because of his relationship with the one true living God. He had a relationship with God and it was stronger than any kind of influence the world or Babylon or anything had upon him. You know, the reason being is because even though Daniel lived in Babylon, he was taken from Jerusalem, he was not of Babylon. Even though he lived in Babylon, he was not of Babylon. They took Daniel out of Judah, out of Israel, but they did not, did not take Israel out of him. You know, the same thing that God was trying to do with the Israelites after Egypt when he was taking them through the desert, he was leading them and they left Egypt. But what God wanted to happen is for Egypt to leave their hearts. He wanted Egypt to be taken out from within of them, within them. Because we could see as soon as trials or something happened in the desert, as soon as something they didn't like occurred, they would always come to Moses and be like, oh, it was so much better in Egypt. Oh, why'd you take us out of here? We could have had food in Egypt. We had all the things that we wanted in Egypt. It's a very similar thing here for, uh, for Daniel in reverse though, because he came to Babylon. He came to this perverse nation. Babylon nowadays correlates to our world, to the world's systems, to religion, to things that are just evil and detestable to God. He was placed in Babylon, but he was not of Babylon. He always remembered who he was. He always remembered God and he always carried God with him in his heart. And you know, why does this relate to us? Like I said, we live in modern day Babylon. We are surrounded by everything in this world that is trying to destroy the image of God. Everything in this world is trying to tell us to be just like them. You could do whatever you want. You have the freedom to do anything that you want. Dear friends, real freedom is not doing whatever you want. Real freedom is the, having the ability to say no to something whenever you want to. A lot of people be say, are, are say a lot of times, oh man, if I just drink once, if I just smoke once, if I do this once, it's okay, I can stop whenever I want. Believe me, I can stop whenever I want. It's a trap, do not fall into that trap. Because as soon as they get there and they try to stop and they can't, they realize they're in bondage and that there is no freedom. 
Freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to stop doing anything you want at a particular time. That is true freedom. Freedom is walking in whatever God has for your life. You saying, Lord, I let go of everything that I want. I set myself free from the things of this world. And I want to walk in the things that you have for me, oh God. I want to walk in your will. I want to walk and step with you. When the world says, oh, have a drink, we are to say, no, no. When the world is smoking, we are not to be smoked. When the world is cheating people out of money, we are not to do that. When the, people, when the world is lying everywhere they go and in everything that they do, we are not to do that. We are to be honest. We are to look completely different than this world. I remember a quote somebody said that for some reason there is a bigger influence of the world on the church than there is the church on the world. The church is getting more and more influenced by the world and all the young people influenced by this world then the church is having an influence on this world but it's not supposed to be like this but it's not supposed to be that way and the book of Daniel shows us that you know the interesting thing about the prophets when I read through them a lot of them are like we have to return to Israel we have to return to Israel and that is important every single one I think that's a very important thing that they return to Israel but the book of Daniel is saying something that is counterintuitive. He said, no, I am not going to go. I'm going to stay in Babylon and I'm going to have an influence in Babylon and I'm going to make sure that everybody in Babylon knows there's a one true living God and he wants to save every single one of them. That's what the book of Daniel is representing. That's what the book of Daniel is showing. He wasn't looking to flee away. When this decree came, he didn't run away. He didn't stop praying. He stood there. He did the same thing that he was doing before. And you know, I just want to say a testimony. And uh, it's not my life, it's the life of my grandfather. And I truly think that my grandfather was a man that was set apart. And I remember at his funeral, uh, we were gathering, people are saying stories about him. And uh, I, know, I knew a lot of stories about my grandfather, but it was the first time that I heard this story. My grandfather was a bishop in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and the Soviet Union. His name was Leontie Lulkin. And um, I remember listening to this story, and it's uh, one of the weekends, my grandfather got asked to go to visit another church, and my mom had the opportunity to go with him. Uh, a few brothers and sisters went also, and they're driving, and they're coming back. It's a Sunday night, and they're coming back to their home, to Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan. And uh, they reach the summit, they reach the overpass, and I mean, it, it started snowing so, so hard. It started pouring down snow with everything that it had. I mean. You couldn't see more than a foot in front of you. And you have to pass the overpass. And there's cars lined up everywhere. And everybody can't pass by. Because on one side, there's a mountain. On the other side, there's just absolutely nothing. That If you fall down, it's imminent death. It's just a huge, I don't even know how to call it, a gap where uh, cars, anything fly down, that's it. And I remember my mom telling me this story because she was in the car. Everybody in the van, they're like, man, we have to get back to home. We have to go home. We have work on Monday. Our children have school on Monday. We're already being persecuted. If we miss one day of work, that's it. We're not going to have a job. If our, our students are, um, I mean, our kids are already being persecuted in school. If they miss a school day, that's it. They might get thrown out of school. We don't know what's going to happen. We have to go. And they're already like uh, developing this mindset like, man, maybe we shouldn't have went to this trip. We don't know how spirit led it was. You know, like we knew that this is going to happen. Why is this happening? And all those cars are also waiting. And uh, my, my mom is looking at her dad, my grandfather. And uh, my grandfather walks out of the car and is like, this is what's going to happen. I mean, out of all the cars that have been there, I, was, I asked my question. I'm like, why my grandfather? Like, what was so special? Why did he do it? Like, you know, like that's, uh, I don't know how to explain this. So what my grandfather did is that he exited the car. He's like, what's going to happen is I'm going to be walking down this mountain. A couple miles down, it's pouring snow. And you're going to be following me, close behind me in the car. And we're going to make it down the mountain. And we're going to make it to work. And we're going to make it to school. And God's going to lead us. God is going to help us get through this. And, um, oh man, I'm sorry, guys. Uh. It's a very powerful uh, story to me. And uh, the thing that really gets me is that when he was walking down the mountain, mom said, we heard him. We heard him reciting the Bible the whole way down. 
He was reciting Psalm 23. Every Psalm that he knew, he was praying the whole way down. It's pouring snow. He can't see more than a foot in front of him. If he takes one wrong step, that's it. He's going to die. The people in the cars are going to die. And he's, he's praying and he's walking down this mountain as if nothing's going on, as if it's the sunniest day ever, as if nothing's there. And you know, they made it down that mountain. Not only them, but every single car that was there followed them and every single car made it. And when the cars up, uh, that were still up top didn't have anybody to take them down, my grandfather went back up the mountain and walked them down as well. He made sure everybody made it that was there at that time. And my mom said, I was looking and I, I, I seen next to your grandfather, somebody walking with him. He wasn't walking alone. He said, I, I seen Jesus, he was right there. He was walking with him down that mountain. And you know, in my life, I want to ask that question. And everything that I do, whether I'm in school, whether I'm in church, whether I'm at a family gathering, whether I'm, whatever I'm doing, wherever I go, is Jesus there right there with me, walking down with me? Am I set apart? Do I look like this world or do I say no? No, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to do the things that Jesus did. I want to speak the way Jesus spoke. I want to have an impact on this world. And I always look back on that story and I'm like, man, my grandfather walked with Jesus and I want to walk with Jesus. We have to walk with Jesus for the sake of this world, for the sake of the sinners who are going to hell. They don't know what they're doing. They're living in darkness. They don't know who the light is. They don't know who God is. They don't know what Jesus did on that cross for them. They might say they know or heard about it once or more, but they don't really know. It didn't have an impact on their heart. They don't have the revelation of the Son of God coming down and dying for all of our sins so that then we could be free. They don't know. But Daniel says, shows us that we can be the light in the darkness. But Daniel shows that we can be the light in Babylon. In Persia, Jesus shows us the same thing when it was the Roman Empire, when it was no longer Israel there, but just a religious system. They didn't have a relationship with God and Jesus showed them that there is, it's, there's an ability to be different. And you know, I wanna continue to my second part. And we're going to read from Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 through 15. And this is the, how do we do this part of my sermon? Or what are the practical, practical steps that we could take to do this? And you know, I'm going to read uh, from Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any God or man besides you, O king, for my 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? Then the king replied, the statement is true according to the law of Medes and Persians. We may not be revoked that they answer and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is the one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making this petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel, and even until sunset he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by, agreement to the king, and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. And the main point is what did Daniel do to be set apart? What did Daniel do in his private time to be different, to be able to do the things that we read in the first part? And number one, what I see here is that Daniel obeyed God. Daniel obeyed God in that fact that he chose not to worship anything or anyone besides the God of heaven. He chose to obey God and God alone that nobody else deserved glory. He, he read about what the law says, that you shall have no God before me, and Daniel chose to believe in that. Daniel chose to walk in obedience to God and God alone. I wanna read two quotes. It says, others perhaps considered it risky for Daniel to pray as was his custom, but Daniel knew that the safest thing he could do was radically obey God. 
Another quote is, it isn't hard to see why people are men pleasers nowadays. It seems as if people have the power to hire, fire us, to break our hearts, to slander us, to make us make our lives miserable. But the power to obey God and stand for him comes from unsettled understanding that God is the one that is truly in control. And I think it's so important that we obey God in everything that we do. That even though from time to time, from season to season, from the Babylonians to the Persians to the Greeks to the Romans to the American government to from different presidency to another presidency, we don't know who's going to be on the Oval Office. We don't know that who's going to be the one in control or the leader of the country, but we always know who's on the throne. We always know that God is the one that is in control. We always know that we have to obey God. I think this part of the Bible where Daniel still, in, in verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house into his roof chamber, the upper room. I mean, foreshadow to the New Testament. Uh, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had previously done. I think this is a great example of obedient disobedience. He was, you could say, disobedient to the decree or the law that was stated that Daniel was not to worship anybody else except for the king, Darius. But what Daniel knew is that he could not, he just cannot do that. That he, he knew that his loyalty was first to God and God alone. He knew that he had to still spend time with God. He knew that he still had to worship the true living God. He knew that he still had to spend time in prayer. And you know, with this, we see that he chose knowingly that he's gonna end up in the lion's den. Your friends, walking with God or being set apart, I'm not gonna promise you, I'm not gonna say what a lot of preachers say about prosperity and all these things, that everything's gonna be good, everything's gonna be great, you're gonna be a millionaire, you're gonna do this, you're gonna go places, you're gonna be so famous and stuff like that. I don't believe that to be true at all. I believe that God does bless us. I believe God gives us peace, gives us love, gives us joy. That if you work hard, that God's gonna bless that. I believe that, I truly do. But I do not believe that everything's gonna be dandy and that your life is gonna be all full of rainbows and sunshine. We see what happened to Daniel. Daniel's gonna be thrown into a lion's den. We see what happened to Jesus. When Jesus, all he came to do was to heal, to set free, to restore and Jesus was crucified. I'm not saying that you're not gonna go through persecution. I'm not saying that you're gonna not go through hard times in your life, you will. It's a fact, Jesus going on the cross does not negate the fact that we, are, it doesn't just take away all suffering, period. Jesus did something special, yes, he took all our iniquities, all our pain upon himself on that cross and gave us a way to salvation, but what it also showed him going to the cross is for us how to suffer how to walk through suffering, because suffering is gonna come in our life. Because it happened to Jesus, it happened to Daniel, it happened to David, it happens through all, all, all the scriptures. But a posture that we have to have when that is going on in our life, when Daniel was going through this, when Job was going through his suffering, is that no matter what is happening, no matter what's going on, I know because I know because I know my Redeemer lives, my God is alive. That even though right now it may look tough, it may look like I'm going through hell itself, that everything is going against me, my Redeemer lives. My God is alive. My God is faithful. If I put my trust in Him, He will deliver me. He will get me through whatever I'm going through. And even if He doesn't, I think that's a very powerful verse in the book of Daniel chapter 3, that, and even if He doesn't deliver us, the three young men said, even if we do get thrown into the furnace and God does not deliver us, we still won't bow down, we still will not worship because we know that it is wrong. And that's what it is saying here that we have to, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of everything, obey God and all his commands and everything that he's saying. Even if we don't see it happen here on earth, we know that we're gonna spend eternity. Eternity it doesn't compare to the 80 years that we spent here on earth with the Lord. We have eternal glory and eternal worship with him in heaven. Another thing that I see that we must do to be set apart is that we have to set, to be a set apart, you have to set time aside for prayer. To be set apart, you have to set time aside. It's, an, it's one of the most important things you could do in your life is have a prayer life. 
is to be part of the PCU community, is being part of the Player Closet University, is coming on your knees where nobody sees you, and sp spending time with Jesus in whatever way that looks for you, whether that's you driving in your car to work, you have the opportunity to spend time with Jesus. Whether, whether that's you going to a coffee shop and you don't know what else to do, you put on your headphones, you're listening to worship music, you're reading the Bible, you're praying, that's amazing. Whether that's going into your room, closing the door where nobody sees and praying there to God and spending time with him and talking to him, that is important. We have to do it. We must have that time in our life. Tim Delina said a very interesting quote this past Sunday. He was also talking about prayer and I really like this quote uh, of what he said, and it's such a simple quote. You think like everybody says that, or you hear it so many times in our life. But what he said is that you will never find time for prayer. You have to make time for prayer. There will never be time in your life for prayer. You have to go and find time for prayer. You have to go and make that time for prayer. You have to get rid of something else in your life then. You have to stop and someone's calling you to go uh, hang out or something like that or you have you want to watch a movie or something like that you have to say no to that and you have to say yes to spending time with God you have to go and you, you have to set something else aside and be like no I have to spend time with the Lord I have to have my daily devotions I have to read the Bible I have to listen to worship music it's a thing that I have to do not because I just have to do or that's something God commands if I don't obey him he's gonna strike me down or anything no because that's who you are you're a Christian you're set apart you're to do what Jesus did when he walked. And I think it was a very special moment where I was watching The Chosen. It's a series on Jesus Christ where Jesus was just the whole day healing people, setting people free from uh, evil spirits. The whole day, I mean, hundreds went by while his uh, disciples were arguing and something like that. And it's already night. It's already like midnight. And Jesus is walking back from healing all these people, not forgetting about anybody. And he walks straight into his tent he gets on his knees and he begins praying again. And you're thinking like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I, a lot of times I use this excuse like, oh Lord, I was just too busy. You know, I, I worked 12 hours that day. Uh, I had to go hang out with people. That's important. Oh, I have to spend time with my family. Oh, it's important to me that I get some kind of rest. Oh, eight hours, that's, that's great. I need to have eight hours of sleep. But Jesus, if you think about it, how much more busy was Jesus in his ministry, in his life? He had hundreds of people come to him. He had to heal so many people. He had to minister, he had to teach, and amongst all that, he had to discipline his disciples. They were always doing some random things, like Peter would just say something crazy or something like very action-y, and he's like, let's go do it, we're gonna cut off their ears, or let's send fire down from heaven, and we're gonna uh, make sure this city get burns or something like that. You're like, what? And Jesus is just standing there like, are you serious? Like, you guys don't get the point of my message, my ministry? So Jesus was infinitely more busy than every single one of us, but yet we know by reading the New Testament, he found time for prayer. He found time that he separated for God. And we have to do the same. And with that, I wanna to go to my last part, or part three, as I read over. And the, the last uh, part of this chapter is the results of people being uh, set apart. What's gonna happen, or why do we have to be set apart? And we're gonna read from verse 16 to the end. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep was fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn at the daybreak and went into haste to the lion's den, whom he had... When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, serv servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lion's den? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, and as much as I found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king have gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them, their children and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. I'm gonna get back to the last four verses. But here we see some things that are resulted out of Daniel being set apart 
verse 16, we see you being set, up, set apart, you trusting God will give, give others faith and hope. And verse 16, the king, King Darius, I mean a secular king, a king that worshiped many gods who didn't know who the God of gods is, who Jesus is, says these things to Daniel. Your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. I mean, that is just a crazy statement by somebody that does not know God. That is such an amazing and powerful thing that the king said to Daniel because he did not have a relationship with God. He didn't know God. And yet he said that your God will deliver you because he's seen the trust and faith that Daniel had in his God. And with that, let's go to verse 17 uh, of that. Uh, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. For me, this is just an interesting verse because honestly for me, it foreshadows when the tomb of Jesus was also covered with a stone. And we know how that story went. We know how this story goes. That not a stone, nothing, not death itself could hold Jesus back from his victory, from his glory. And the same thing with Daniel, that he overcame because he was set apart, because God shown his favor upon him. Uh, verse 18, God, and uh, so let me read verse 18. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting. No entertainment was brought before him and his uh, sleep fled from him. Daniel being set apart, Daniel trusting God, Daniel going through this trial knowing that death is the thing that he was facing, allowed God to begin to work in the heart of King Darius. It says Darius went into fasting. It says Darius had no entertainment brought to him. It says Darius was, uh, something was happening with him that he couldn't just sleep even. God began working in his heart. And you know, another thing that you being set apart and you having a relationship with God, what it does from verses 19 to 23, being set apart gives God an opportunity to do a miracles in your life. You being set apart, you saying, I'm not gonna take control. I'm not gonna do what I want to do. I am not gonna do what the world is doing. Even if I face death, even if I face persecution, whatever is coming my way, you are allowing God to do something miraculous, to do something supernatural in the natural. God is gonna move, God is gonna hold you in his hands. God is gonna always be with you. God is gonna be standing right there next to you, walking with you down the mountain, through the valley, whatever it might be that you're going through, God is going to be there. Just like in the story of my grandfather, he didn't have to go. They could have stayed another day on that mountain. And I, I always think, why? God, out of everybody, hundreds of people were there. He went. Why did he go? And I got an answer for that. So because he knew me, and he knew that when he was walking down that mountain, I would be right there with him, and that no harm was gonna come to him. And that every single person that was with him and every single person that he prayed for and every single person that was on that mountain was gonna make it down that mountain. You know, the story of my grandfather is a very interesting one. He was born in an atheist family. His parents didn't know God. His brothers and sisters didn't know God. At a teenage age, he was invited to a church service and he was saved by God radically. And he comes back home and he's like, I'm a Christian. And his parents said, no, you're not. He's like, what do you mean I am? God saved me, I believe in this guy named Jesus Christ. He went on that cross for you, for me, for everybody. And they're like, no, you have to choose now. You have to make a choice. Either you choose God and Jesus or whatever you're talking about, your religion, or you choose this family and your name and everything that you have. And he's like, I cannot leave God. I cannot leave Jesus. I, I have to. He did something for me that I, you guys can't even understand. And they disowned him. They disowned him as a son. He was no longer part of their family. They kicked him out, everything. And actually, as he was leaving, they said some kind of profane or funny word to him. And my grandfather took that, and that became his last name. That became, for him, like a symbol of where he came from and where he's going. That's where the Lurkin family com uh, name comes from. It's from that, actually, which is very interesting to me. But after that, I seen the amazing things and heard the amazing testimonies of what God was doing through my grandfather in Uzbekistan, in the Soviet Union. I heard about the many healings 
that when people would come, they wouldn't be going, and it was Becca said, they wouldn't be going to the hospitals, they'd be going straight to my grandfather. My grandfather would pray for them, the ministers would pray for them, and they would receive healing on the spot. I mean, people would come with unclean spirits, and my grandfather would pray for them, and they would be completely set free. I mean, in everything that he did, even the smallest things, people from America would come and bring a few candies to my grandfather to try. He would come home and he would divide it into 11 pieces because he had five sons, five daughters, and his wife, and he wouldn't even take a piece, and he would give it to them. I mean, he would be walking by, going home from work on the street, and it's cold beyond freezing temperatures, and people would be to the side of the street freezing, homeless people and he would take them into their house and he would feed them and he would clothe them and he would give them a place to sleep. And this always gave an opportunity for God to move. This always allowed him to minister to people, to that world. He was set apart. He found time for God and everything and everything that he did. I think it is so important that in the, it's interesting to me in the Old Testament, God created a space and he told people to go and fill it and they couldn't do it. And as time moved on in the Old Testament, God is now saying, you create a space for me, and I give you a promise, I will fill that space. If you create a space for me in work, I will fill that space for you in work. If you fill a space, if you give a space for me in your relationship, I'll be part of your relationship. If you give space for me in your ministry, I will be part of your ministry. If you give space for me in everything that you do, if you create a space for me to fill, if you allow, to move, allow me to move in you and through you in everything that you do, I give you a promise that I will fill that space and I will do whatever you need me to do. I, will, I am choosing to partner with you. From the beginning of the Bible, God is looking for partners. God is looking for people that are willing to be set apart, to walk with him, to be the light in this world. And you know, to finish off, I want to finish the last couple of verses. And it says this, Then Darius the king wrote to all the people's nations and men of every language who are living in the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So, so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Just a conclu concluding point, if we could all rise to our feet as we're going to go into prayer. A concluding point that I want to say, not just for this last chapter of Daniel, but for the whole book of, book of Daniel, first six chapters that we read, say a very similar story. When we live a set-apart lifestyle according to the Spirit, God honors and protects that, and then the testimony of God's work makes the ungodly see and tell the testimony of God everywhere that they go. We see this when Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, we see this with Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Nebuchadnezzar. We see this with Daniel and Belshazzar. And now we see this with Daniel and King Darius. At the end of every single chapter of the book of Daniel, the first six chapters, you could see ungodly people, people of the world, people that were just evil, that were bad, that were just conquerors, that didn't care about anything, that served many gods, all give glory to the Most High God, give glory to our God. And that's what a set-apart set lifestyle is going to do. It's going to allow other people in this world to see who God is to you and make them want to accept them, that God, into their life. And so the testimony of God is going to run rampant and people are going to be saved, people are going to be set free, people are going to be healed, and people are going to be saved. And the, the goal that God wants, he says, I want all to have everlasting life. I don't want none to perish. And you know, with that, I want to address something. A lot of people ask me, it's like, Vitaly, you know, California is getting so corrupt, so evil. It's, it's getting darker and darker. Are you thinking about leaving California? Are you thinking about moving? Are you thinking about this? We're going to have to flee soon or whatever. And my answer to that, if God leads you to move, go for it. But I'm not going to make a move until God tells me. Until God tells me, Vitaly, you have to go here and here. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to do what I was always doing. Because who's going to stand in Babylon? Who's going to stand in Persia? Who's going to stand here in Sacramento? Who's going to stand in California and be the light to these people? 
when more darkness comes, that means the light's gonna shine only brighter. But for us, for some reason, it's the opposite. A lot of times when darkness comes, we decide to run away. But who's gonna be the light in that situation? Who's gonna stand here in the gap for everybody that is going straight to hell? If it's not me and you, I don't know who's gonna do it. It has to be us. Daniels have to rise up in Babylon and Persia and stand in the gap and look different and be different and spend time with God and allow to God to move in them and through them and everything that they do and everywhere that they go so that the testimony of God can arise. A lot of people will be talking about the end times. The end times are near. The end times are coming. Oh no, it's going to be so bad, so evil. You know, there's a promise. The end times are coming. That is true. But it also says with that, that there's going to be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the end times. That God's glory, God's power, God's control, God's grace is going to be poured out even more than it was before. That the former house, is going to be, the latter house is going to be more glorious than the former we get so scared and caught up in this idea of fear that everything's going bad, everything's getting worse and worse, that we forgot who we stand before. We stand before the God of gods. We've seen in the Old Testament, we've seen in the New Testament, we've seen in the book of Acts, when they were getting persecuted, when darkness did abound, God always came through. God always did his miracles. God always spoke. I don't believe that this is not just a history lesson that the Bible is just a historical reference. No, it is living, it is alive, it is for us right now, it is for us today, and everything that we do, and everywhere that we are, I still believe that miracles do exist. I still believe that God does heal people, that we don't have to go to hospitals or uh, expect us to deteriorate or anything like that or to die from some kind of sickness. I believe that our God is still a healer. I believe that if you need an answer from that God and you come to him, that God is still going to answer you. I believe that if you need to be set free from something and you come to Jesus right now in this place or wherever you are, whenever you want to, you come to him, he will set you free. I believe that our God is still living and he wants a living relationship with every single one of us. He wants every single one of us to be set apart. He wants every single one of us to walk with him. He wants to do all these miracles and amazing things through every single one of us. And I'm not just talking about on a Sunday service in church. I'm not just talking about a youth service on Thursday night. I'm talking about every single day of your life is going to be a testimony of what God is doing. I'm talking about us leaving the four walls of the uh, four corners of this wall uh, four walls of this sanctuary and going out into the world going out into the marketplace going out into our schools and our workplaces and having an impact there because of who you are and because of what God's going to be doing through you I believe that's what God wants to do in every single one of our lives and I truly stand on that that God is still looking for people to partner with so that he sets you guys apart and so that you guys can be his mouth, that you guys can be his feet, he, he, you guys can be his hands, so that you guys could go and do the things that we must do. And with that, I want to pray. Let's all pray. I just want to pray for every single person in this place, for the young, for the old, for it doesn't matter who. If you don't know what your calling is in life, if you don't know what God is calling you for, if you're not set apart and you want to be, if you want God to use you, if you want to be used in your workplaces, in your schools, in your other places that you go, in your hangouts, in your friend groups, if you have neighbors that are saved, if you have family members that are not saved, if you want to be set apart, if you want to be different, if you want God to move in you and through you, we're going to pray for that right now. That God does a work in your hearts, that God transforms your heart, that we not get conformed to this world, but we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So let's pray. Lord, I pray in Jesus' mighty name, God,